EduVenture first. So EduVenture is a new nonprofit organisation aimed at encouraging more students to pursue careers with a social impact. And we are very excited to have already about 10 universities wanting to set up their own society at their university. I run the University of Exeter EduVenture Society. And it's a way to really connect yourself with lots of opportunities and amazing people like our guests today who have chosen careers that really contribute to the world and to people around them that you might have struggled to find through your typical university connections. So I'll, I'll stay on a little bit, I think, at the end of the webinar, if anyone wants to talk about how they can set up their own EduVenture Society at their university, or if you guys just want some more information on other events we'll be running. Um, and we are running this series throughout the rest of summer, so there'll be more webinars coming up on more exciting careers, and you can check those out on the website if you guys are interested in more of these. I might just give people maybe one more minute. I don't want to jump in it's too early. We've got until people... six o'clock. When, when, when do we finish? Yeah, 6 p.m. I know you guys have plans, um, don't you, at six. So I don't want to keep you too long. But yeah, we'll, we'll finish at six-ish. We'll ha I have some questions in about five, or three, three, two, three minutes. And then um, I'll leave time for everyone to ask a few questions if they have any. Um, Speaking of which, if you guys have any questions coming to mind right now, just while we're waiting, there's a Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom uh, where you can enter your questions and um, I'll try and get to those to ask our lovely speakers. And then if you really like a question someone else has suggested, you can vote for it to make sure that we answer it and it will push it up in the question section. Right, I think I'll start now. So this series is very important to us because we really want to be introducing amazing people like Laura and Andy, who are working on projects to really help other people and help improve the world that we all live in. Um, Go to Co China has amazingly paired with EduVenture on this project and Go to, Cho go to Co China run um, programs in summer where you can go teach in China, you can gain your TEFL certification, um, teaching abroad and it's amazing I can't recommend it enough I got to do it last summer I went for as long as possible I went for almost three months and applications for you guys to go if you want to um, in 2021 are already open on their website so go and apply now if you think that you know you've been stuck wherever you are for too long because of COVID you want to get traveling next year and um I will add, like I've said, a little bit more on EduVenture for you guys right at the end of the webinar, or you can check the website out for more information where you guys booked in with us. So I think I'm going to hand over to Andy and Laura to start asking a few questions about um, your jobs and everything amazing that you're doing. So Andy, if you could please introduce yourself, that would be amazing. Hello, my name's Andy Hicks. I am a wellbeing coach and the core of what I do is I teach mindfulness and meditation and I do that in companies, schools. I've done that a couple of times in prisons and I do one-to-one -one coaching as well. Amazing. Laura? <laughs> Great. Absolutely amazing, Andy. Um, so I always find it really hard to describe what I do, um, but essentially it's to connect people to their deeper selves which i believe is connected to everything so it's about how we can shift our perspective through an embodied sense of, of who we are and i work with lots of different movement styles um, like qigong and feldenkrais and yeah lots of stuff like that and i also have worked with theater for four years so i run a theater company four and a half years now, um, which is all about how we can step into the experience of connection through the body, um, which was greatly inspired by the overview effect, which was when astronauts went out to space and they had, had a shift in cognitive awareness about who they were and their connection to everything. They came back down to earth, changed um, and started nonprofits and yeah, realized that we shouldn't be hurting ourselves, hurting the planet um, because we're all connected. So in a nutshell that's it <laughs> i love that in a nutshell so many different exciting areas so 
That's amazing. So for students, I know that we look up to people like you who've really chosen to do different things and built your own companies and you've both got really exciting projects, which I'm excited to hear more about. Um, but did you go to university? And if you did, what did you study? Sort of what were you doing when you were sort of 20s? Andy, I don't know if you could tell us about that. Mm -hmm. I did go to university, went to Royal Holloway, University of London. I now live in Holloway and everyone was always thought that that's where Holloway was, but it's actually in Surrey. And it's named after someone called Thomas Holloway who created the first ever all women's university. Um, except now it's mixed, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Um, and I did history and Spanish, but when I was there, I actually didn't feel that excited about history. I was really passionate about climate change. Um, so I was really into my pe the people and planet society and being an activist and campaigning, um, much more so than, um, the argument between the Pope and the King of Germany in 1750. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think that getting immersed in activism really drove my career by getting me focused on what do I care about? And therefore, what do I want to spend my time working on? As opposed to thinking in terms of how do I get a career that's going to earn me a salary? <clears throat> mm. I think that's really important. What about you, Laura? What did you study? Yeah, so I actually took a year out of the school because I didn't want to go to university and I traveled and then I realized that actually I did want to go to university. So I did um, philosophy and theology in Nottingham and I found it quite cerebral. And by that, I mean, it's all very heady and you sit there and like my sort of connection, my fun time was spent when I was traveling or when I was out partying to be honest with my friends and that's when I was exploring consciousness and reality and all the things that I really deeply care about so I guess I chose the subject based on like if there was a subject that was academic that I could do what would it be and I was my parents kind of really encouraged me to do something academic like I couldn't do drama and I couldn't do anything that wasn't or spirituality anything that wasn't academic and I just ended up back at my heart at the end anyway doing what I I'm doing now um, but it was in Melbourne I did a, a study abroad program where I studied anthropology and the philosophy of philosophy of philosophy um, and we looked into consciousness and reality all the things that I'm really passionate about and that was where I kind of realized um, and I found these thought leaders like Daniel Pinch Burke and Terence McKenna the people that really inspire me now um, who are who are doing similar things to me so yeah it was it was a step on the path to where i am but it wasn't i wouldn't say that that informed kind of where i am now if that makes sense yeah definitely so both of you i guess then to a degree like found things that really interested you and maybe influenced where you are now while you're at university but maybe you didn't study exactly what you're doing now so what was your first step after university? Did you know that you wanted to go into more sort of mindfulness and well-being, or was that quite a long and sort of winding path, I guess? Andy, do you want to start? I would say yeah, it was quite, it was quite a winding path. And um, I, I was um, thinking today that maybe I could sum, sum up the journey with um, the gesture, it's your fault. So as an activist, it, I was always doing that. It's you, the bad guys out there, the people that don't care, the people polluting, the people who don't recycle, the people who just get on planes and don't think about it. It's your fault that the world is going to be ruined. And since then, I've heard you might have come across this idea that when you point a finger at someone, you're pointing three fingers back at yourself. And oh, the, interesting. So, yeah, that's the journey that I've been on is recognizing more and more that my own well-being and happiness isn't dependent on changing what them out there are doing. It's changing what I'm doing within myself. So as an activist, I wasn't at all focused on that. I was focused on changing the whole world. Mm. And that was my first job was as a sustainability manager at my university. And then my second job was um, student switch off. It was... Um, this guy called Neil created the campaign with the Eco Power Ranger and he got himself dressed up in green spandex and um, would 
basically do energy saving campaigns in halls of residence in universities and made a living doing that and hired me as his first employee. Um, and the reason I decided to stop doing all the climate change stuff was that there was, um, it, just, it just seemed like it wasn't working. Like I, it didn't seem like we were changing the world. And I think particularly with climate change, it's really hard to see that anything you're doing is having an effect because it's all, all so indirect. Yeah. How do you actually see that carbon emissions are going up or down? And there was a particular moment um, where a lot of people that I knew became disillusioned, which was in 2009, there was a big UN meeting to make a, a global agreement on climate change that was billed as this kind of now or never moment. If we don't get a global agreement now, we're going to run out of time. It was obviously 11 years ago. And um, we didn't get the agreement. And a lot of people I knew became very disillusioned and burnt out. And I just had this very strong feeling of, of the futility. Like, why, what, what is, what's the point of everything I'm doing? And um, I sort of stepped away from being an activist. I set up a video production company um, called Hicks Media. And I did that for a few years. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do that was to do my own thing. And also it allowed me to not commit to any one cause. I felt like I had all of this energy and passion that if I could just find the right place to channel it, it would be really powerful. I just couldn't find what I believed in. And um, being a video producer, I could work with lots of different organizations without needing to kind of really massively support their particular mission. Even though I didn't work for companies, I didn't, you know, they were doing anything destructive. I didn't necessarily really believe in what they were doing and um it was only when i i had a girlfriend who again in our relationship i was like it's your fault it's your fault this relationship's not working out uh, nothing to do with what i'm doing and i spoke to my friend who is a therapist and i said how would you help someone like my girlfriend she's very anxious she has very low self-confidence low self-esteem um and it's, it doesn't seem like there's anything I can do because whatever I say, it just kind of bounces off her. She can't internalize positivity from other people. Mm. And he suggested that she could try meditation. And I ended up breaking up with her. I didn't actually tell her, Kate, you need to meditate. Um, I just thought, okay, well, I'm going to try meditation to see how, how it works. And then I can tell other people to do it because I'm mm. fine. I don't need it. And I since found out that FINE is an acronym. It stands for fucking incapable of naming emotions. And that was completely me. I've been fine my whole life. I've never been anxious. I've never been sad, never been angry. Just fine every day of my life, all day, every day, which is obviously not true. I was just completely out of touch with how I really felt. And once I started to meditate, I started to realize I wasn't fine. I realized how physically agitated I was, how much tension there was in my body, how hard it was for me to sit still. I was always shifting around and trying to clip my neck and clip my shoulders. And I couldn't concentrate because I was so distracted, so much busyness in my mind. I didn't know how I was feeling. He would ask me in the meditation, how are you feeling today? And I would always say, neutral? I don't know. And I, I, I thought, how boring to be neutral every day. I can't be neutral all the time. Um, but what happened, the more I meditated, is I started to have experiences where I felt incredibly peaceful, incredibly loving, euphoric, sometimes like I'd actually discovered ecstasy only a few weeks before I discovered meditation. And I found I had the same effect without the drugs, which is amazing. Um, and incredibly connected to myself, to the people around me. It felt like my whole life had turned into an adventure, whereas before it just felt like a a stressful scrabble to get to the end of the day without anything going too badly wrong. So I'm someone, when I find something that helps me, I always want to tell everyone about it. So mm -hmm. I kind of made that into my, into my job, to sh sh sharing the, the mindfulness and meditation that helped me so much with, the people, uh, with other people who were also interested in it. Amazing. So you kind of went on your own journey, tried different things and then realized that what would help, like what your real passion was, was helping other people rather than, I guess, a specific other more environmental impact. It's about, helping other yeah. people, but with a, um, a very, a very kind of attentive awareness of, am I just saying 
you're the one with the problem and you need to do this or am I also mm -hmm. practicing it myself like integrity and practicing what I preach is incredibly important to me and and, and um I'd never want to be someone who for example who goes around saying everyone should meditate but I don't meditate I always try to I always do the things that I'm suggesting other people do as well and I'm always trying to recognize if someone if I see a problem in someone else or someone suffering from something do I also suffer from that do I also have that issue so I'm not I'm trying not to do this and saying like so you guys out there that have the problems and I don't I think that's amazing that's definitely very key I feel like a lot of people when they're going through something do feel a little bit preached at maybe or like their problems are being brushed aside just because a method doesn't work for them or they're not sure how to identify like you were saying that you didn't even realize that saying I feel fine is not the same as actually being okay. I think a lot of people have experienced different areas of that, especially right now where students are very stressed and a lot of people are very stressed with COVID and knowing what's going on in careers. So I'm definitely excited to hear more about methods and things that you work on with people. Dora, how did you find what you do now and what did you do after university that led you to where you are now? Yeah, so I'm really, thank you, Andy. I was down with you very deeply, and this is why. Um, so after university, I went into working for nonprofits. I was also a big activist, um, mm. super disillusioned um, by slaughterhouses and animal rights as a young child, because I was brought up kind of like with that information in front of me. My dad was vegetarian from a very young age and very passionate about that. So always told us the truth about these situations. So I, I grew up with a lot of anger about that and about the environment and what was happening. Um, so I started working in places like the United Nations in New York and doing internships at all these different NGOs um, in New York and in San Francisco and London. And what I realized upon traveling down to the Amazon rainforest in um, Ecuador and Brazil was uh, that we spend our whole life, I, I was <laughs> spending my whole life pointing outwards at this is the problem, you're the problem, he's the problem, the government's the problem. And when I discovered shamanism, which is this sort of ancient indigenous um, technology, uh, culture, tradition around working with plants and working with altered states of consciousness, I basically realized that I'd spent all this time pointing outside of myself, but never really looked within myself as, as to why my perception was such and why I was so angry within myself. And I realized that sort of the inner world, if this makes sense, and the outer world are actually linked. And that if I'm feeling this stress and this anger within myself, then I'm causing that with every interaction that I, that I meet, that I come across in life. And, um, I wasn't a happy person and so finding this path which basically took me within took me within myself really enabled me to see that well-being and how we are doing within ourselves and our perception on the connection between everything was the key to taking the step forward to becoming a an embodied planetary one consciousness connected humanity and that it wasn't about getting angry and othering. It was actually about understanding that we and feeling that we are connected. So my work really led me to creating this experience for people so that they were able to really see and feel and purge, let go of their emotional trauma and return to a state of connection with themselves, with everything. And it was a long path, winding, bendy, um, took lots of different routes, including the theater, to now um, doing these workshops that Richard comes along to, which is why I'm here, um, on getting people to become more in touch with themselves and to let go of what isn't serving them and come deeper into their hearts so that they can feel connected. Um, it's been a tough journey, but really I wouldn't ever choose anything else, you know? So I hope that answers the question. It does. It was really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. I know both of you have been talking about um, really like gaining connections within yourself before you can connect better with the world and other people. For all of the students and people watching who are maybe feeling a bit disconnected right now, a bit isolated, do you have any sort of top tips or advice for ways to feel 
like you have a better understanding of how you feel in a situation ways to sort of look inside yourself and see how you feel and then how that can help you connect with maybe your family or reconnecting with friends and people that you work with Andy I don't know if you have any tips on that well um obviously meditation <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um <clears throat> yeah that's that's been the key for me and uh it's in, in a very kind of straightforward and direct way what i'm doing in meditation is i'm training my attention onto my own body and mind so i'm i'm increasing my level of awareness through doing that on what's going on inside of me as opposed to looking at this plant over there or looking at the sky i'm looking at i'm i'm feeling what's going on in my body feeling my breath noticing what thoughts I'm having. And by doing that repeatedly, at the moment I'm doing an hour a day, you get more and more awareness of how your body feels, what emotions are going through you, uh, what thoughts are going through your mind. Um, and I think that's really the key to, um, well, to, to everything really, but definitely to um, being more self-aware, having more awareness of your emotions and ability to communicate them. I better start meditating then. I'll start tonight. We'll be asking you for some tips later. Nora. Well, I've got some um I, I uh, I've got some meditations on an app called Insight Timer. Okay. Which is a free meditation app. And there's about ten on there which you can which you can access and uh, have a go. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sure a lot of students here will be trying this out on the stress later. Laura, what are your tips? Yeah, uh, similarly I do a lot of meditation and for me it's a life practice so what I see meditation as is observing equanimously which means non-reactively the sensations the emotions that are coming up coming up through you and to allow them to pass through you fully and to let them go so it's a practice to sit through that in stillness to allow whatever's coming up to come up and to then release from your system and when we're able to do that and i mean like on a moment to moment level you i i my experience is that um we're able just to continually allow things to be as they are without needing to constantly react to them and change them through our internal state and it's we are only in control of ourselves. We can only change this energy field here. So if we're able to be at peace within ourselves and not react and to allow things to be and surrender to that, we're going to be much more peaceful, happier people. And everyone we interact with on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis are going to feel that and it will transform. That energy will reverberate through our lives and through, through the world. So yeah, that would be top tip number one. Um, Secondly, there's a lot of um, emotional release techniques that I use, which I'm happy to share with you guys, like Qigong, there's some really simple stuff. Shaking is a really great one to release cortisol, the stress hormone. If you're ever feeling a little bit stressed, a little bit triggered, um, animals do it in the wild, and we've just forgotten how to do very simple things like this. So just take a little shake break in the toilet if someone <laughs> upsets you or something happens. Uh, and then finally, nature. These are the really simple ones. Um, yeah, just getting out into nature, maybe taking your shoes and socks off and just grounding yourself in the soil and just mm -hmm. connecting with the trees. It's 20 minutes in nature. It's been scientifically proven to just completely reduce stress levels. So that would be my three that I would say first. I'd, I'd just like to add another one to that, um, which yeah. is telling people, telling someone who you trust genuinely how you're feeling rather than saying you're fine. I've been making a particular practice of this um, over the last few months, my mum's been going through a really difficult time. She's, she's had a kind of mm -hmm. breakdown where she's been, since the beginning of lockdown, suffering from really intense depression and anxiety. She's been zoning out and, and not able to communicate at times. She's been having panic attacks that go on the whole day. She's been hitting us. She's been kicking. She's been throwing things around the house. She's been just a million miles away from her normal self. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so one of the things that I've been trying to do is just be, very, it's very easy to very, be very focused on her all the time, how is she feeling? And one of the things I've been trying to do is practice saying, I'm feeling really sad about right now about what's, what's happening, or I'm feeling anxious that she's going to get worse, or I'm feeling frustrated um, that she's still not better or whatever. It's just so that I keep acknowledging and expressing what's going in, on in me um, through this whole experience. And, um, 
and what Laura was saying about being equanimous to your own feelings also applies to other people's feelings. So when she's, um, for example, like this was, this has been one of the most challenging times to practice it. Her trying, like trying to hit me, which she, it, she doesn't do viciously. It's like a sort of like, almost like a toddler. She, she's like, I don't want to do it. I don't mean to do it. But it's like, she says she's like, she's possessed. She just has to kind of lash out. She's obviously got so much emotion in her that doesn't know where to go. Mm. And so it's very easy for me to get very frustrated and angry. And at times I have actually shouted being like, stop doing that, mom. But it just makes her more agitated when I do that. And so mm. I've been trying to make a practice of being present and being accepting and not kind of fighting or getting angry um, with what's happening, which is really challenging in that kind of situation. Um, but a lot of the time I have been able to do it and I've been able to see how, how much it helps to react like that um, rather than getting upset or angry about, what, about how she's feeling. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I know that a lot of people will be experiencing a real mix of obviously just situations, especially right now where everyone's stuck in one place and you don't always have the same escape that you normally do from a situation. So... Yeah, it's very, it's very important. I think like you both have said that people can kind of take that time, think about how they're feeling. And it was really positive to hear from you that you're really working on recognizing and looking after yourself as well as your mum. So thank you so much for sharing that. Can I also um, add one oh, of yeah, the- Oh yeah, of course you can. It's, yeah, that it's really normal. Like we're like nature, so we have cycles. It's really normal to not feel okay. And that is okay to just sit with yourself in that. Because I think we are so used to want, wanting to be just happy all the time. I know I have that within me. And nature has cycles, as do we do. So, yeah, just allowing whatever is to be um, is, is really poignant. And if you do want to shift your, your state, I find that focusing on gratitude and where it is that you want to be, so your vision for your life is, is also really powerful in, in moving that through you. Thank you. And accepting how you do feel now as well. Uh, I, I think that's another thing I've been trying to do with, with my mom, just like accepting this is how she feels now. Until we accept it, until she accepts it, it won't shift onto something different. Mm. So both of you run different projects to do with well-being and mindfulness and supporting people in becoming more connected with themselves. But what specific sorts of projects have you worked on in the last year and how do you feel that they've benefited people? Andy, do you want to start? Just put you on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess my overall project is make a living doing what I love. Yeah. And um, that's something that I've been working on for about six or seven years. Well, I guess, I've always been working on it, but specifically with mindfulness, that's what I've been trying to do. And um, within that, I guess the, the easy part for me, uh, and I know this, this is not the easy part for everyone, is knowing what I wanted to do and being able to do what I do. The hard part for me has been selling it. And actually that is very, very common amongst coaches, yoga teachers, nutritionalists, uh, mindfulness teachers, people that do um, uh, mus musicians as well. So anyone who's doing something they're very passionate about, they often find it very difficult to sell it. And I think, I, I think one of the reasons for that is it's incredibly vulnerable because you're basically saying, this is a piece of my soul, or this is a piece of my heart. Do you want to buy it? And if someone says, no, thanks, that doesn't look very interesting to me. It can feel really crushing. Um, and it can feel like they're saying no to your whole dream of what you want to do with your life. And it can feel like no one's ever going to say yes because this person said no. So for me, a big part of what I've been doing is, is trying to get over my fear of rejection and just consistently be offering and offering and offering and, and not get um, too upset if people don't want it. And often it's not because they think, it's, almost, it's pretty much never really because they think what you've got to offer is rubbish, which is what my fear is. It's just that it's not for them or it's not the right time or they don't have the budget or um, it's, it's not what they need right now. So I've been working on um, building uh, more opportunities uh, to go into companies or do Zooms with companies. Um, I've been um, doing workshops with them on things like um, man managing stress and anxiety, how to disconnect from work, 
um, the business case for kindness, how actually kindness, being kinder can help you in business. Um, I've also been doing one-to-one -one coaching with people where I use mindfulness and meditation to help them with things like stress, anxiety, depression, getting divorced, wanting to get a promotion, um, having problems with their relationships. And um, I do one hour sessions with people once a week and I teach them to meditate. I teach them to be more accepting of their emotions, to come into a positive relationship with the different aspects of themselves that maybe they don't like or haven't acknowledged. And I've also been a trainer for the Mindfulness in Schools project who teaches teachers who teach teachers to teach mindfulness. Um, so I teach teachers to teach mindfulness in schools uh, through them. And I also go into schools directly and teach um, secondary school kids mindfulness. And I have three times now been into a prison and had a group of, of, of um, inmates who I'm doing mindfulness with and trying to, uh, to get them to engage with it and, and, and see if they find it helpful. Um, so yeah, overall project has been um, earn, earn enough money to make it work. And I've been doing that through multiple kind of channels. Wow, so that's, that's a lot of different groups and projects you've got going on there. That's amazing. Yeah. I know that a lot of students, I think, would be very excited to know that there's more work being done with younger students to become more aware and more mindful because a lot of, like, I didn't have that at school. I think it would have really made a big difference to how I saw myself when I was younger and the levels of stress that I brought with me to university and how to handle those. So that's definitely something that I think is really important. Mm. It's definitely growing. There's definitely more and more schools that are offering it now. Mm. What about you, Laura? Remind me the question. It was <laughs> how many projects. It's okay. It? So what's going on? Um, what projects have you been working on, sort of over like the last year or so? And um, are there any new projects you're working on that you'd like to share? Yeah. So, so I was working for Extinction Rebellion, um, which mm -hmm. you guys have probably heard of. I probably don't have to explain that. It was quite rife in the news last year, beginning of this year. Um, and I was working on how it is that we can do, uh, create a heart-led, heart-led, connected activism rooted in, in the perspective of connection rather than othering. So it was quite cool to be brought back to my activist roots from a new perspective. So without being like the government needs to change, although a lot of the people within XR, Extinction Rebellion were kind of like that, but my role was to sort of connect them and to, figure out how it is we could do things differently. So that was really cool. Um, I ran two groups within XR, within the regenerative cultures circle. So it was how it is that we can tr transition and embody, transition to and embody a regenerative culture. So if we live in a degenerative culture, one that is sort of in disconnection with the planet, how could we become connected? So from the inside out, um, and that was really fun and, really challenging as well actually and I coordinated two groups within XR. One of them was the land um, group so it was all around how we can give people the experience of connecting with the land um, and land-based communities and like growing vegetables and just getting out there connecting and connecting to the cycles of nature and applying that to the way that we work and not just being in this sort of do 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 go 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 burnout activist culture that was definitely repeating itself and presenting itself within XR. So it was all about the inner work. And then the Heart Openers, which was the, another group that I ran, which was um, just basically seeding hundreds of people on the floor at the rebellions, um, the sort of the actions themselves in London and getting them to, and it sounds ridiculous, but it works, getting them to dress up as fairies and mystical creatures and just connecting people to their inner child and to joy and to, liaising with the police and just making it this like utopic exciting creative world um that drew people in rather than made them think they're just you know dirty hippies or they're angry or you know just made it this really attractive love-based environment and um, so i did that and then uh i i have my workshops as well which um one of them is 
emotion release. So it's all about how it is we can really deeply check in with ourselves and our emotional, our sense of our emotional presencing where we are and release what isn't serving us, what's, what's rooted in fear. So I work with a lot of different meditation techniques like Vipassana and uh, Qigong and Balinese movement studies and dance and just ways in which we can deeply and somatically, which means connect with um, our bodies on an experiential level. Uh, if that makes sense. If there's any questions, please type them. Um, I know it can sound a bit, when I speak, being in this world, it might be a bit alienating, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, and then the other workshop that I do is on self-love. So what I realised was that if we don't love ourselves, um, how can we love anything else outside of ourselves when we are a reflection of everything, everything is connected. So I found that the most important work actually was to express love within ourselves so that we can express the love outside of ourselves. Um, so this workshop is yeah, all about tools in which we can use to, to connect more deeply to our heart and essentially just a more beautiful perspective of the world and of ourselves. So those are my main things at the moment. And then, yeah, before that was my theatre, which longer than a year ago now, so I won't go into that, but yeah. That's really cool. Could you possibly sum up what Extinction Rebellion is, just in a sort of few short sentences for anyone who hasn't come across it, please? Sure, yeah. So, whew. so Extinction Rebellion is in response to the current situation on planet Earth, which um, according to current climate science is that we have about 10 years or less left if we continue going at the rate we're going with carbon emissions and I mean destruction, planetary, planetary destruction. So XR basically grew out of, um, of the need to want to change that and was formulated by two people. Um, one of them was Gail, is Gail Bradbrook and the other Roger, Roger Hallam. Gail went across, I'll just tell you this quickly because it's why I got involved. She went across to Costa Rica and she never flew or anything. So she paid all her carbon taxes on this. She felt she, she didn't really have an option but to work with these plant medicines, which were Iboga and Ayahuasca, and said a prayer to the plants, asking them for what are the codes for social justice. I've worked my whole life to try and change things and nothing's worked. And she came back to London and met Roger Hallam. And I heard this story in a podcast when I was living in America and I, I had needed to come back to London to work with them because of what happened. Basically, she came back to London, spoke to Roger Hallam, and he had been studying revolution and how it is that we could bring about a revolution and they sat down together and he told her for four hours everything that he had studied and the most likely way that we could overturn things and at the end of them speaking to each other he tapped her on the shoulder and said by the way these are the codes for social justice and it was her belief he's not a spiritual person at all but it was her belief that um it was her prayers being answered and so they enacted this and within the first couple of months it was this global movement and there were people from all over the world coming together to basically um, create what is called mass civil dis disobedience. And the idea was to get about 1% of people out on the streets, at which point there wouldn't be enough police to control um, people saying, no, we need to stop business as usual. We need to do things a different way. But it was coming from a quite a deep perspective on of love basically of being like let's come together and change this um, and create a new world and sort of demonstrate that on the streets and so sort of closing down roads and just just standing there and, and creating music and yeah it's very successful so you may if you google it you'll see it all over the media um different perspectives on it of course but yeah mm. um so both of you obviously then realized in more recent years that mindfulness was what you wanted to do after you know following different things you've both been in activism so I guess that's given you a lot of drive a lot of motivation because you know that it can be difficult to make things a reality I know obviously Andy talked about being a little bit disillusioned by the challenges of pushing through climate change but what would you say really helped when you were trying to start out yourself so if you were a student now trying to start you know a business something to do in 
in the sort of similar areas to you was it your network that was most beneficial you know were did you get funding or was it very much something that you kind of did uh partially on the side and then you had another job and built up like how did you get started in creating your own business in this field and um, do you want to start well when i started my first company mm -hmm. um I had a little bit of savings, so that's a really good start because otherwise you put yourself under a lot of pressure to start making money straight away. Um, and then it was, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's mostly, it was mostly for me about building a network. So with the video work, it was about meeting more and more people that might want videos at some point and um, staying in touch with them. And uh, particularly joining a co-working space in London really helped with that, being part of a network rather than being at home by myself where how am I ever going to meet a client in my flat in Clapham? And um, sometimes going to events and stuff. We just lost Laura. Um, she's vanished. Hopefully she'll come back. Hopefully she'll be back, yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, and... With this company, um, with doing mindfulness, it's, yeah, it's been very similar. It's about, it's, I think I used to think of, of being an entrepreneur, being, setting up a business is about coming up with a brand new thing that's never been thought of before, like a new invention um, mm -hmm. or a new, a new type of company um, that didn't exist before. But actually, there are lots of mindfulness teachers. There are lots of people who make videos and you don't need to be the only one or even the best one. You just need to be someone who knows enough people who can give you work to make it work. Um, and the, probably there are, there are a lot of, uh, for example, video producers who were better than me who had less work just because they didn't have the network. They weren't as, as good at finding people who wanted to give them work. Um, so I think that's the key. It's about, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but business is about relationships. It's about um, knowing enough people who, who can give you work and being, being confident in what you do enough to talk to people about it. That was a big challenge that I had with the mindfulness work that I, I felt um, I had imposter syndrome. I felt like people would think I, I wasn't experienced enough. You know, I hadn't been a monk for 10 years. I didn't have a degree in it. I didn't have loads of qualifications. So I sort of hid a little bit. I didn't tell very many people about what I did because I, I thought they might judge me or find me out as being not good enough. And um, so it's been a, a real journey of being, of building my own confidence in what I'm doing so that I'm more willing to, to offer it to people. Hmm. And do you have any tips for building that kind of network? Was there anything that you feel worked really well for you in trying to really persuade people to choose you as, you, your, as the contact for mindfulness? I think the first thing is to be very clear, like turning inwards, first of all, and being clear on who, who do you want to work with? What yeah. kind of a person do you want to work with? Um, probably you want to bit work with someone who's, actually, who's quite committed rather than someone who's flaky. Um, you want to work with someone who's really interested where, rather than someone who's like kind of not bothered. Do you want to work with women? Do you want to work with men? Do you want to work with bankers? Do you want to work with the charity sector? Um, or are you really, really open to working with someone, to, um, with someone from any kind of background, but like, as I was saying, like someone who's really keen to do it. Um, and then being clear when you're talking to people that that's what you're looking for, going to events where those people go um, and telling everyone you know, like a lot of people think of sales and marketing as like, I've got to find people out there in the world that I don't yet know. But if you start by looking at your own network, uh, your own, you know, my first client I got for it because my, my dad worked in a government department and he said, well, why don't you speak to HR in, it happened to be the Department of Energy and Climate Change, funnily enough. Um, yeah. And that was my first piece of work. Um, I went into my sister's work at ITV. Um, then the next piece of work was I met someone at a party. I worked for PwC and I was just talking about what I did. And he said, why don't you come to my company? So it's about just talking to everyone you know, everyone you meet about what you do in a clear enough way that they could think of someone you could talk to, someone, someone that they could connect you to, or maybe you put workshops on and you can invite them to something directly. 
So um, I, I guess my main piece of advice is start with your existing network and think, who do I know or who could introduce me to someone as opposed to like, how do I just build up this huge mailing list of people that I don't actually know and then I could just send them loads of stuff? Or how do I put loads of adverts on Facebook and attract people who I don't know? Start with who you know and build out from there. Thank you. That's really good advice. <laughs> so, Laura, obviously Andy has just talked about how his network was extremely useful in really getting him his own startup up and running with mindfulness and how really being clear about exactly what, his, what he offered and exactly how he could help people was really, really key. How did you get started? And did you find that similarly your network was extremely useful or were there other things that played a role in really helping you spread what you do? Yeah, so I think both. Um, but essentially, I would say what I always tend to do and what I've done for many years now is always come back to the drawing board. And by that, I mean, what do I really enjoy? What brings me the most life? And if I sit with myself and I really consider that and tap into that and I write those things down and then commit to following those things. I remember living in San Francisco and I got really lost. I was like, what do I actually want to do? And I was like, this is such a really exciting point, actually. I can do anything. So I spent the summer just like trying, you know, technology for mindfulness and futurism and all of these odd things like coding things I, I was like no I don't like that and I try all these and then through going to meetups actually it was a big thing in America I'm not sure if it is so much here but going through it to events cacao ceremonies like anything just trying all of this stuff I would meet people that um were doing things that were really interesting and I would I just sort of through following my passion through finding out what brought me joy and brought me life and meeting people that were doing interesting things. I, I just sort of started going on that path and it was, I was always disencouraged from doing acting. It was the thing I really loved at school. It was the thing I was like, yeah, good at. And then everything else I found a bit, yeah, sitting down all day, just not, it did, I'm a very embodied person. And traditionally we're told to sit there and to listen and regurgitate information. It's just not how I learn. And I didn't know that growing up. And um, it wasn't until I'd done the UN stuff and the, uh, the nonprofits in America that I was like, do you know what? I've tried now all of this stuff, mum and dad. Like, I actually now want to go to acting school. So I did a master's in acting because I was like, that brought me joy at one point. And I did not know that that would then take me to spirituality, essentially. And all the things that I mentioned before with Shamas, it was creating my theatre company and then going into these workshops. And you just aren't necessarily gonna know what it is that you want to do. I remember someone once saying to me, what you're gonna do is not created yet. And I was like, that's, that's actually quite liberating to think that that's a possibility because then it means it could be anything. And the only, yeah, the advice I'd give is, is what, what excites you, what brings you joy. And if you don't know what that is, just begin exploring these things, going to events, meeting people and being open to that and yeah, really open to every conversation that you could possibly have as well because yeah it, I think that's how you really begin to find your path in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, I know obviously a lot of students are a little bit adrift we don't know what we want to do yet there's a lot of choices and I think as the years go on stuff like what you guys are doing is going to become hopefully more and more part of everyone's lives because it is so important and maybe, you know, it would be a good industry to keep getting involved with. Um, I know a lot of students would love to know if you feel like your work has particularly impacted anyone or um, how you feel that the work that you're doing can lead to real social change or positive impact in the future to create more awareness about, I guess, mindfulness. And if you're still doing any projects with environmental and I know that Laura does a lot of stuff on connectivity um, how do you feel that what you're doing is going to maybe inspire other people to continue to move to become more mindful or how do you feel like you're impacting people in the companies that you've worked with Andy? Well one of the things that I've tried to do is um, is really let go of the mindset of I need to be changing the whole world otherwise it's a waste of time which I believe very very strongly 
So for me, if I, if I help one person in one moment or in one workshop to feel a little bit better, then I feel like I, that's, that's enough. I don't have to do more than that. Um, so for example, today I did an introduction to meditation and mindfulness for a company. Um, people scored themselves at the start uh, an average of about seven out of 10. And by the end, every, the average was nine out of 10. So very kind of clear improvement for just from sharing some stories and doing some meditation together and um, learning a bit more about what mindfulness is. And I guess the times when I see in more, in more detail um, what it's doing for people is when I do the coaching and I get to hear a little bit more about what impact it's having. So um, I had one client who was uh, incredibly stressed and anxious and also she kept getting stuck in toxic relationships where the person wasn't treating her very well, but she just kept coming back to them all the time. And she just felt like her, her life was a bit of a mess. And through doing the meditation and mindfulness and um, practicing self-love, as Laura was talking about, it really is the key, the key to what I, what I do. Um, she is like, she, and she'd signed up for, um, for CBT classes because uh, she was so unhappy by the time the CBT referral came through, because it took a couple of months, she just picked it up and laughed because she's like, I don't need this anymore. I'm so happy now. Um, and she went to see the CBT teacher, uh, practitioner anyway. Um, and she said, <laughs> she just told her about all these things that she'd doing with, been doing with meditation and mindfulness and how, how, how it had, had taken her out of that, of, of, of that um, anxiety and, and depression and, and how she was so happy now. And uh, CBT teacher said it was the best, <laughs> best appointment she'd had all week. Um, and now she's met someone and she, he, she, he treats her really, really well um, because she's shifted how she's feeling and what she's, what she's giving off. She's attracting different kinds of people. And um, it's the best relationship she's been in by miles. They're really, really happy together. They're going to move in together soon. Um, and it's just been a really um beautiful and encouraging and inspiring to see how much how profoundly these practices can help someone and take them from from a very very unhappy place to somewhat to feeling very you know she's one of the happiest people i know i think she's always so bouncy when i talk to her on the phone and so full of wisdom and insight and and she's really been able to take to to completely change her perspective on some of the really difficult things that have happened in her life and see them as positives that she learned things from that made her stronger um that made her more resilient so um that was yeah it's 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 uh it's a really really big perk of my job that i get to see and hear and feel the impact of it all the time whereas when i was doing my video work for example i'd i'd create a video send it to somebody and if i was lucky i'd get an email back saying thanks <laughs> That I wouldn't get I wouldn't get to see the impact of it at all um, so yeah I, I would say that um, all the people I work with it has, a, it has an impact I don't know like what bigger impact that has on the environment or society but I trust that it's enough um, for me to be doing what I'm doing and and the impact will probably grow as I get more confident in what I'm doing and and do it more I think it's very exciting to hear that there's more careers where you can really genuinely leave a positive impact on people and really see that because obviously it's just not the same as being maybe in a larger company and not going to experience one-to-one -one the real positive changes that you're making. So that's amazing. Laura, I know that you've partially answered for someone here already, but could you possibly expand a bit on um, how you also feel like you're Sort of having an impact and how much change you feel that you're having through your work okay. yeah yeah so i resound again with andy like i spent a lot of my life wanting to make this like massive change in the world and i was so ambitious and to be honest it was rooted in ego um and what i discovered was that yeah the advice i would give to myself now looking back um part of my journey was to let go of that and to realize that making just the smallest amounts of difference within my own energy field, my own self and one other person is enough and is so profound and huge. 
and so with the uh, work that I do now I do one to one I didn't mention that either but um, I do one to one work with people healing work um, on yeah similar things to Andy on yeah, self love and connection and um, trauma as well um, and mindfulness and hearing when someone is suffering so deeply from something within themselves when they are able to reprogram their inner world their inner state so this the self um, sabotaging stuff that can go on within our minds around i'm not enough i'm not good enough the stuff maybe you've been brought up with or you've been conditioned with in society when you're able to reprogram that and by that i mean let go of it and create a new story for yourself your external world this is my experience um will change hugely and so i've also got very similar um success stories where people who were super depressed and like suicide suicidal actually someone recently and now in a completely different state within themselves and have found love and because they were able to love themselves first and they were able to just completely transition their inner story and therefore their outer world so those yeah being hearing those stories is more fulfilling than i can even say to you like the, the path hasn't been easy and it's required a lot of discipline a lot of failure and getting back up again but when someone is truly healing on that level and groups of people like in my workshops i have sometimes 30 people 50 60 in my last workshop and then the feedback that you get when someone last week said to me i was never able to look at my body i was i was ashamed of myself and now just because of this one exercise that i put in this workshop I'm able to look at myself and feel beautiful again is just so deeply touching i can't explain it in words so yeah and just to briefly answer the overall question um i would say that our inner state and our inner ability to connect with ourselves and the rest of the world is in my opinion in my experience the shift that we need to make in order to live in a harmonious and more balanced world where we are caring for each other and we are caring for the planet and we're not in this sort of individualistic kind of destructive degenerative society so i think it is making the difference this kind of work i know we're coming close to the end of our time now but do we have time for one more question for both of you we can be brief we can be brief amazing um, so if you guys offer help um, or collaboration opportunities for new mental health startups, how do you do so? How are you able to support them? What well, like, do you do? I'm not quite sure what the question is. So if there was a mental health startup, how could we help them? Yeah. So do you do any collaboration with um, new mental health companies or would you be able to help students or people coming into the industry get set up and give them advice? Mm, possibly, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'm working with a, a new mental health startup at the moment called Open Mind and they mm. um, offer wellbeing um, workshops to companies and I'm, I'm one of their teachers. Um, so cool. in that way, I'm working with them. I'm not one of the people that runs the company. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess, I, I mean, I'd be very happy to talk to people if they wanted, if they were thinking about setting up a mental health startup and wanted some advice. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, if we've been brief, I'll just, shall I go? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Cool. Um, yeah, ditto. I um, would be happy to talk to people. I really feel that yeah, the deeper stuff is around the connection, as you probably got from this. Um, <laughs> so I'm happy to share everything that I've, yeah, learned from that and how it is that i've got to where i've got to being supported and being able to completely 100 percent financially support myself through this work as well which has been a real journey but i'm there so that's that's really exciting um and i've worked i am sorry i'm about to work with a charity called kairos which is all around um people who've suffered quite severely from drug addiction and I could go into what I really believe that is, but it's this sort of ex seeking external fixate fixes to our internal problems um, in quite an extreme way. So if we can get people like that, homeless people and addicts feeling a deeper connection and more integrated in society, and we're potentially going to do trips with them to sacred sites like Glastonbury and doing exercises 
exercises around connection and self-love with them. So that's something that I'm going to be working on soon, hopefully. So can I just say one more thing? Yeah, of course you can. Uh, apart from to say that um, Ali, you've been incredibly good as an interviewer, very confident and professional. Oh, and Laura, you. I felt so much warmth hearing you speak. And it's like, you've had so many similar experiences to me. It's, it's amazing. Even with the theatre stuff, that's something that I'm really passionate about as well. Um, I just wanted to um, say this poem that um, is very relevant to what we're saying. It's called Clearing by Mary Postlewaite. And it goes, um, Don't, do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. That was really beautiful. I've never heard that one before. I feel, I feel bad. I'm an English literature student. I should know about this and have to look into this more. I was, thank you so much. And it has been amazing speaking with both of you. I know you have, you've added some really amazing food for thought. We will add all of your links to all of the stuff that you're running. I know a lot of it's in the chat, but we will definitely add it to the website soon and all of this will go up on YouTube and then all of those links will be below so that all of you can get involved in all of these amazing projects. Um, but I know you both have to go, I think. <laughs> Got busy evenings. Um, so thank you again. I will stay on here for another five minutes if anyone watching has any questions about EduVenture and how it works with the universities. Um, but yeah, I know a lot of people are already messaging to say thank you and thanks again guys. It's been wonderful to meet you. You're welcome. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you both so much. It's been lovely. And am I able to stay on and just answer a couple of these questions in the chat? Of course you are. Yeah, I just, I know that I don't I've want to I've got to go because I'm doing, I'm doing yeah. a course on um, humour that starts at six o'clock. Nice. Oh, cool. Well, have a great time and thank you so much for joining us, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So say thank you very much, Andy and Laura. That was amazing. So thank much you. food for thought. Thank, thank you so you. much for coming on. Enjoy the humour session. Thank you. <laughs> See you later. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to, I know that Laura's asked, answering a few, a few questions in the chat very helpfully. So if you guys have a few more questions for Laura, get those in quickly. I'm sure she'll answer those for you. Um, but just to tell you a little bit more about EduVenture in case you are here to hear about that. Um, EduVenture is, I mean, obviously I'm gonna recommend it, can't recommend it enough. Um, but I run the University of Exeter Society and we will be running a lot of events over the next academic year focused on webinars like this that really pair students with unusual people unusual careers and how to get into those how to grow confidence in building a career out of something that you're really passionate about that the university or your department just might not be able to necessarily connect you with um, if you're really interested in finding out more you can go to the website where we posted all of the information about this webinar and you can also find the website link in the chat box. Um, we will be, as mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, running more of these every Wednesday for the rest of summer. Yeah, pretty much every Wednesday and they will be on more careers sort of beyond the ordinary, careers you might not have sort of come across before or just don't know how to get into. And if you want to start your own EduVenture Society at your university, then there is an email contact on the website that you can email to explain why you're interested and I will get back to you and we can have a talk about that and how you can get more involved. Um, I know especially with COVID obviously and some universities being online next year, some opportunities or classes being reduced and societies not necessarily being able to run events in the same way people are a little bit concerned about career opportunities how to apply for things and how to gain all of these opportunities and 
we will be running online events 100 percent it's going to happen and most of them will be open to all students not just students from the specific university where the society is and a lot of societies i'm sure will be doing collaborations so we will be posting these events um, on uh, let's say linkedin maybe sometimes if they're open to all students there's a, an eduventure linkedin page that you guys can like and then see all of the opportunities on there and i'm sure we're posting some of them on the instagram and the website so even if there is not an eduventure society at university and you're not ready to set it up or busy or you know you just want to get involved with some events definitely keep an eye on the website keep an eye on the instagram and we will make sure that there are some events that everyone can come to that again cover interesting and unusual opportunities to do with having a positive social impact so that's all from me don't know richard if you've got anything that you want to add no that's all great <clears throat> covered everything i just say though for those that are interested i dropped some links into the chat so Andy and Laura, both I've attended both of their sessions through Psychedelic Society and Lovers in London, and it's um, they're both just amazing facilitators and really, really do help you get down and deep into inside yourself, realizing what matters to you, connecting with your emotions, and trying to work through some of maybe any trauma you have, but also just to kind of connect yourself with yourself and with the world, and it's just really worth attending. So I've put some links in the chat, so you can see there's ones for. Laura's on Saturday, every other Saturday, has a great session of emotion release, which I very much recommend. And then the next self love workshops on the 6th of August, I think is right, Laura. Um, I put the link there anyway, so you can um, go check them out. But I highly recommend them if anything today in today's talk resonated with you. Um, go check those out. And Andy also does um, has uh, kind of events happening all the time. So if you just keep keep an eye out, keep Googling him, you, you might find one, but there's not not one currently to, to show. Um, but very, very wholeheartedly recommend. Um, and then, yeah, on Edge Adventure, do get in contact if you want to set up a society or just get involved or um, have any thoughts on speakers for future webinars. Um, then do just drop us a message. Love to hear from you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. I think I'm going to thank Laura again for staying on to answer some <laughs> extra questions. It's so nice to have people that genuinely are really interested and passionate about what they're doing and just want to help young people be able to do more and follow what you, you're up to. I think that's what it comes from really. It's like if you really tune into what you really, really want to do, that's what's going to drive you. Not the money, mm -hmm. not the, you know, and you can make money from that. It's just tuning into that first. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been really Have a lovely evening. Yeah, you too. See you guys. Thank you everybody. See you. Thank you.